Hey, you might know that I've been reading Alexander Solzhenitsyn's over 2,000 pages of the Gulag Archipelago. This is volume two, and I've just finished it. They're about 700 pages a shot. I just want to share a few bits with you with this uh, here. Now, this is pretty grim stuff. Some of this might not be, you might not want to hear some of this before your next meal. But since the, the trends in our world are toward a return towards Marxism and communism, very strong trends I see like that, might be good to hear from somebody who actually was in the labor camps and the prison camps. So just a few selections here. Let's start with this one. And here's, this is, a, uh, this, is, this is from a camp. Here is how they kept prisoners in the punishment cells. Poles the thickness of an arm were set from wall to wall, and prisoners were ordered to sit on these poles all day. All night they lay on the floor, one on top of another because it was overcrowded. The height of the poles was set so that one's feet could not reach the ground, and it was not easy to keep balance. In fact, the prisoner spent the entire day just trying to maintain his perch. If he fell, the jailers jumped in and beat him. Or else they took him outside to a flight of stairs consisting of 365 steep steps from the cathedral to the lake, just as the monks had built it. They tied the person lengthwise to a balan, a beam, for the added weight, and rolled him down. There wasn't even one landing, and the steps were so steep that the log with the human being on it would go all the way down without stopping. Well, after all, for Poles, you didn't have to go to Sakirka. They were right there in the Kremlin punishment block, which was always overcrowded. Or they might put the prisoners on sharp-edged boulder on which they could not stay long either, or in summer on the stump, which meant being naked among the mosquitoes. But in the event, one had to keep an eye on the culprit. Whereas if he was bound naked to a tree, the mosquitoes would look after things themselves. And then they would, could put whole companies out in the snow for disobedience. Or they might drive a person into the marsh muck up to his neck and keep him there. And then there was another way, to hitch up a horse on, in empty shafts and fasten the culprit's legs to the shafts. Then the guard mounted the horse and kept on driving the horse through a forest cut until the groans and the cries from behind simply came to an end. So here's page 51. In the winter, the ill and aged, sitting there in underwear and sacks, could not make it to the baths from the company bunks. They were done in by the lice. They hid the corpses under the bunks so as to get the extra rations, even though that was not very advantageous for the living. The lice crawled up from the cold corpses onto the warm living survivors. Okay, this is about a camp chief of the camp of Yuglag. Nikolai Andreevich Aglanov arrived. He liked at lineup to pick out some brigade or other which had been at fault for something or other and order it to be taken aside. And then he used to empty his pistol into the frightened, crowded mass of people accompanying his shots with happy shouts. The corpses were left unburied. In May, they used to decompose. And at that point, the goners, who had survived until then, were summoned to cover them up in return for a beefed-up ration, even including spirits. At the Serpentinka, they used to shoot from 30 to 50 men every day under an overhanging roof near the isolator. Then they dragged the corpses off behind a hillock on tractor sledges. The tractor drivers, the stevedores, and the gravediggers lived in a separate barracks. After Garanin himself had been shot, they shot all of them too. And another technique was used there. They led them to a deep shaft blindfolded and shot them in the ear or the back of the head. No one mentions any resistance whatsoever. They shut down the Serpentinka and leveled both the isolator there and everything connected with the shootings and filled in all those shafts as well. At those same gold fields with, where no executions were conducted, notices were read aloud or posted with the names in big letters and the alleged causes in small letters for counter-revolutionary propaganda, for insulting the convoy, for failure to fulfill the norm, and so on. Let's hear about the women in camp. The male trustees stood on either side of a narrow corridor and passed the newly arrived women through the corridor naked, not all at once, but one at a time. And then the trustees decided among themselves who got whom. According to the statistics of the 20s, there was one woman serving time for every six or seven men. After the decrees of the 30s and 40s, the proportion of women to men rose substantially, but still not sufficiently for women not to be valued, particularly the attractive ones. In certain camps, a polite procedure was preserved. The women were conducted to their barracks, and then the well-fed, self-confident, and, and impudent trustees entered the barracks dressed in new padded jackets. Any clothing in camp which was not in tatters and soiled seemed mad foppery. Slowly and deliberately, they strolled between the bunks and made their choices. They sat down and chatted. They invited their choices to visit them, and they were living, too, not in a common barracks situation, but in cabins occupied by several men. And there they had hot plates and frying pans, and they had fried potatoes, too. An unbelievable dream. The first time, the chosen women were simply feasted and given the chance to make comparisons and to discover the whole spectrum of camp life. Impatient trustees demanded payment right after the potatoes. 
while those more restrained escorted their dates home and explained the future. You'd better make your arrangements, and make your arrangements inside the camp compound, darling, while it is being proposed in a gentlemanly way. There's cleanliness here, and laundry facilities, and decent clothes, and unfatiguing work, and it's all yours. Okay, ever heard of face crime? We're on page 283. Orachevsky had been given only five years. He had been imprisoned for a facial crime, really out of Orwell, for a smile. He had been an instructor in a field engineer school. While showing another teacher in the classroom something in Pravda, he had smiled. The other teacher was killed soon after, so no one ever found out what Orachevsky had been smiling at, but the smile had been observed, and the fact of smiling at the central organ of the party was in itself sacrilege. Then Orachevsky was invited to make a political report. He replied that he would carry out the order, but he would be making the report without enthusiasm. This had filled the cup to overflowing. Okay, page 308, Japanese prisoners. And yet how little, how very little they needed to be saved. Just one thing, not to cling to life, which was already lost anyway, and to rally together. This took place with success sometimes among entire foreign groups. For example, the Japanese. In 1947, at Revuchi, the penalty camp for the Krasnoyarsk camps, they brought in about 40 Japanese officers, so-called war criminals, but one cannot even imagine what they were guilty of in relation to us. It was bitterly cold. There was logging unbearable even for Russians. The Altrit Solovka, the band of rejectors, swiftly stole the clothes of some of them and swiped the whole tray with their bread several times. The Japanese, in dismay, waited for the chiefs to intervene, but the chiefs, of course, paid no attention. Then their brigadier, Colonel Kondo, accompanied by two senior officers, went one evening to the office of the camp chief and warned him, they knew Russian quite well, that if the violence against them did not stop, two officers who had announced their desire to do so would commit harikari at dawn the next morning, and this would be only the beginning. The chief of the camp, the blockhead Yegorov, former political comm commissar of a regiment, immediately sensed that he could very easily come to a bad end because of this. For two days, the Japanese brigade was not taken out to work, was fed normally, and then taken off the penalty regimen. How little was required for struggle and victory, merely not to cling to life, a life that was in any case already lost. But our 58s were kept constantly mixed with the thieves and non-political offenders when we're never allowed to be alone together, so they wouldn't look into one another's eyes and realize who we are. And those bright heads, hot tongues, and firm hearts who might have become prison and camp leaders had all, on the basis of special notations in their files, been culled out, gagged, and hidden away in special isolators and shot in cellars. Here's a shorty from page 328. It was not for show and not out of hypocrisy that they argued in the cells in defense of all the government's actions. They needed ideological arguments in order to hold on to a sense of their own rightness. Otherwise, insanity was not far off. So the, the prisoners in the camps argued about the rightness of the government's charges against them, although maybe 85% or more of these people didn't even know what they were in for or felt like they had been unjustly imprisoned. The glories of, uh, the glories of Marxism here. So in each camp they had all these people, and well, throughout the nation there were people they recruited to kind of tell on other people. The recruitment proceeds by means of entanglement and capture, and his weaknesses are what betray a person into this shameful service, and even those who honestly want to rid themselves of this sticky spiderweb, this second skin, just can't. Just can't. Okay, on page 356, continuing on this same item here, you see it only takes a tiny bit of pressure. A certain AG is called in, and it is well known that he is a nincompoop. And so, to start, he is instructed, write down a list of the people you know who have anti-Soviet attitudes. He is distressed and hesitates. Oh, I'm not sure. He didn't jump up and he didn't thump the table. Well, how dare you? Who does in our country? Why deal in fantasies? Aha, you, so you are not sure? Then write a list of people you can guarantee are 100% Soviet people. But you are guaranteeing you understand. If you provide even one of them with false references, you, are, you yourself will go to prison immediately. So why aren't you writing? Well, I can't guarantee. Oh, you can't? That means you know they're anti-Soviet. So write down immediately the ones you know about. And so the good and honest rabbit, A.G., sweats and fidgets and worries. He has too soft a soul formed before the revolution. He has sincerely accepted this pressure which is bearing down on him, right, either that they are Soviet or that they are anti-Soviet. He sees no third way out. Okay, this is page 384. It was the winter of 1937-1938 a wood and canvas settlement, in other words, tents with holes in them but overlaid with rough boards. The newly arrived prisoner transport a bunch of new interrogation fodder 
saw even before being led in through the door. Every tent in the settlement was surrounded with piles of frozen corpses on three out of four sides, except where the door was. Every tent in the settlement, and this was not to terrify, there was simply no way out of it. People died, and snow was six feet deep, and beneath it there was only permafrost. And then came the torment of waiting. You had to wait in the tents until you were transferred to the log prison for interrogation. But they had taken too much and too many. They had herded in too many rabbits from the hole of the Kolyma, and the interrogators couldn't cope with them, and the majority of those brought here were simply destined to die without even getting to their first interrogation session. So why didn't some of these people up and escape, try to escape? Well, here's page 393. The strongest of these change was the prisoners' universal submission and total surrender to their situation as slaves. Almost to a man, both the 58s and the non-political offenders were hard-working family people capable of manifesting valor only in lawful ways, on the orders of and the approval of the higher-ups. Even when they had been in prison for five or ten years, they could not imagine that singly, or God forbid collectively, they might rise up for their liberty since they saw arrayed against them the state, their own state, the NKVD, the police, the guards, and the police dogs. And even if you were fortunate enough to escape unscathed, how could you live afterward on a false passport with a false name when documents were checked at every intersection, when suspicious eyes followed passers-by from behind every gateway? Now, there weren't often attempts at escape, so often they had to manufacture them. So, page 397. Properly speaking, to beat the fugitive to within an inch of his life and to kill him were the principal forms of combating escapes in the archipelago. And even if no escapes occurred for a long time, then they sometimes had to be manufactured. At the Deben Goldfields in the Kolmia in 1951, a group of Zeks was permitted to go out to gather berries. Three got lost and disappeared. The camp chief, Senior Lieutenant Piotr Lamolga, sent torturers. They loosed their dogs on the three sleeping men, then smashed their skulls with the butts of their rifles until their heads were a massive pulp and their brains hung out, and in that state hauled them on a cart to the camp. Here the horse was replaced by four prisoners who had to drag the cart past the whole lineup. Now one of the features in the camp was the thieves. The thieves were allowed to run everywhere. You know, the thieves were helping with getting rid of private property, so the thieves were kind of an important piece here. Here's a, here's a picture of children. Child, many children got in the camps and joined the thieves. Here we go. Their chief amusement, their constant symbol, their sign of greeting, and their threat was the slingshot. The index and middle fingers of the hand parted in a V sign, like agile budding horns, but they were not for budding, they were for gouging, because they were aimed always at the eyes. This had been borrowed from the adult thieves and intended a seriously meant threat. I'll gouge out your eyes, you blank. And among the kids, too, this was a favored game. All of a sudden, like a snake's head, a slingshot rises out of nowhere in front of an old man's eyes, and the fingers move steadily toward the eyes. They're going to put them out. The old man recoils. He is pushed in the chest just a bit, and another kid is already nailed on the ground right behind his legs, and the old man falls backward, his head banging the ground, accompanied by the gay laughter of the kids. And no one will ever help him up, and the kids don't re even realize that they've done anything bad. It was merely fun, and you'd not catch those devils either. No way. And the old man, rising with difficulty, would whisper with rage, if only I had a machine gun, I'd shoot them without pity. Old Man T nourished a burning hatred for them. He used to say, nothing good can come from them anyway. For human beings, they are a plague. We have to annihilate them on the sly. And he worked out a means to this end. Whenever he succeeded in creeping up on a kid on the sly, he would hurl him to the ground and press down on the boy's chest with his knees until he could hear the ribs crack. But he didn't break them. He would let the kid up at that point. T used to say that the kid wouldn't survive and that there wasn't a physician who could diagnose what was wrong with him. And by this means, T sent several kids to the next world before they themselves beat him to death. Hate begets hate. So near the end of this volume, we talk about losing life or conscience. Listen to this, page 602. Here is how it was with many others, not just with me. Our initial first prison sky consisted of black swirling storm clouds and black pillars of volcanic eruptions. This was the heaven of Pompeii, the heaven of the day of judgment, because it was not just anyone who had been arrested, but I, the center of this world, down the page. And the conclusion is, survive to reach it, survive, survive at any price. This is simply a turn or phrase, a sort of habit of speech, at any price. But the words then swell up with their full meaning, and an awesome vow takes shape, to survive at any price. And whoever takes that vow, whoever does not blink before its crimson burst, allows his own misfortune to overshadow both the entire common misfortune and the whole world. This is the great fork of camp life. From this point, the roads go to the right and to the left. One of them will rise and the other will descend. If you go to the right, you lose your life. And if you go to the left, 
you lose your conscience. Here's how people become corrupted, page 626. Those people became corrupted in camp who before camp had not been enriched by any morality at all or by any spiritual upbringing. This is not at all a theoretical matter since during our glorious half century millions of them grew up. Those people became corrupted in camp who had already been corrupted out in freedom oh, or who were ready for it because people are corrupted in freedom too, sometimes even more effectively than in camp. Finally, I'm going to close with page 654, Igor Yoke's letter. Igor Yoke is six years old. He's writing to his dad. Here's the writing. Hello, Papa. I forgot to write. Soon in school, I will go through the first winter. Come quickly, because it's bad. We have no Papa. Mama says you are away on work or sick. And what are you waiting for? Run away from that hospital here. Oleishka ran away from hospital just in his shirt. Mama will sew you new pants, and I will give you my belt, all the same. The boys are all afraid of me, and Olyeshenka is the only one I never beat up. He also tells the truth. He is also poor, and I once lay in fever and wanted to die along with mother, and she did not want to, and I did not want to. Oh, my hand is numb from right. That's enough. I kiss you lots of times. Igor Yolk. So what can you say when you read these things? This is, this is uh, living hell on earth. I still got to do the third volume. But this is the, the glories of Marxism, the glories of the communist plan. You'd have to be an absolutely deranged person to, um, to want this. And the people that generated the revolution probably didn't think this is what was coming with this popular communist stuff coming along today. Read a little bit of this. Think about some of this. See if this is the way you want to treat your children and your women and the productive people in your society.